Sex Pistols imploded in 1978, the first wave of punk ended as abruptly as it began. The last Pistol show remains a legend for a reason. Like everything that they did, you know, the end captured that moment as perfectly as their beginning captured the beginning moment. Should I stay or should I go now? Clash, England's other main punk prophets, were gaining commercial and critical momentum by fusing their righteous rage with rockabilly, jazz, and ragged. Each record sounded different and just got better and better. You know, you hear the band evolve more than bands evolve in their entire lifetime. It was just a passing phase for this band, and they just kept on developing right to the end. Of course, it's where some of the criticism of the clash from the pure punk community came in, that they did start to pull from other sources and, and that it wasn't just hard, fast, and loud. But all across America, hard, fast, and loud was taking over. Armies of frustrated kids were picking up on punk, waging their own underground wars against boredom and mainstream culture. What's important through the 80s is the evolution of these regional scenes, these very localized punk scenes, and people taking punk, not to hit the Grand Slam, but to be a band that's a rallying point for a community. The whole thing was like, support your local scene. Don't squawk about how there's nothing going on in your city until Black Flag pulls through again, you know. Local scenes were fueled by small, homegrown labels putting out their own music on their own terms. After punk seemed to have died, after the Sex Pistols broke up, the Ramones didn't end up becoming big sellers. Major labels weren't that interested. And this whole network of indie labels starts. <laughs> you're able to sort of um, actually sort of function independently. It was this underground network of fanzines and tape trading. And it got so established that you could actually sort of be a musician, be in a band. Load your own equipment. Make your own record. Get in your own van. Everyone was just doing it themselves. There really wasn't any industry to, to help. L.A.'s Black Flag constructed a punk prototype many would follow. The band toured relentlessly, spreading the hardcore message to whoever would listen. They were the band who, by just being loud and angry, got over to people who never would have understood punk before that. We would play shows, people would just go completely ape shit. Punk resonated in L.A. in a very different way. You can touch that American dream out there, and you can see where it comes up short. Bands like the Circle Jerks, Fear, and the Germs rubbed their pissed off, bare bone brand of LA punk on the face of anyone who could stand the feedback and the slam dancing. We had stage diving, we had slam pits. The kids would get in the middle and it would just be like a big brawl. There were many times that I would stop shows if someone was getting hurt. The point wasn't to hurt people. The point was to act out your aggression. I loved fear. So you can go die. Just hearing them berate the audience, like that to me seemed like your quintessential sort of punk rock show. Insulting people is a good way to get their attention. And uh, that way, we're sure they're going to be listening to what we came to play for them. The nation's capital was also rumbling with its own distinct sound. When I was coming up, all eyes were on Washington, D.C. You had the Bad Brains. Bad Brains schooled everybody. It was like an explosion. They were f***ing amazing. It was an energy and a ferociousness that I don't think any band has ever reproduced in the history of music. Not to mention four black guys in a predominantly white music scene. Changed my life forever. They're, to this day, are the best live band I've ever seen in my life. Tremors were being felt as far away as Minneapolis with bands like The Replacements and Husker Du. Husker Du somehow went from being this band that played really ridiculously fast, and the whole thing about hardcore is you could play as fast as you wanted to. They went from that to being the world's best rock band in something like three years. 
San Francisco's dead Kennedys attacked up class values with their sharp biting lyrics. California Uber Alice warns of fascism in disguise. California Uber Alice, California Uber Alice. I'm glad we're getting under their skin. We're not safe family entertainment in any way. What kept punk so vital through the 80s was not trying to compete with the international stars, but really trying to rally locally. In addition to these local scenes, some clearly defined punk subcultures were emerging. Minor Threat's Fast Furious song Straight Edge praised clean and sober living and inspired a budding movement. Their contribution is kind of doing away with a bit of the self-destructive elements of punk rock. Drinking beer and breaking your head open on the street. Back in Orange County, surf and skate kids found hardcore the ideal soundtrack for their extreme lifestyles. We just had all these kids that showed up to the shows, you know, skaters, surfers, that whole aggressive mentality. We incorporated that into what we were doing. In stark contrast to the punk manifesto of expression and empowerment, a darker element began showing up at clubs. There was a time when there was a lot of Nazi skinheads that were trying to make some kind of statement at a show by beating everyone around them. Nazi imagery was nothing new. The Ramones had sung Leeds Creek Bop, and the Dead Voice, Susie Sue, and Johnny Rotten all wore swash stickers. In America, I think it was always the end rock and roll. This thing that more or less meant, you know, I'm bad, I'm nasty. There's no movement, it's meaningless. Skinheads and neo-Nazis took things much further, latching onto punk's themes of frustration and alienation and turning them into a violent reality. I think when you take it to a movement and you say, I'm anti-Semitic, you're crossing into a place where you're not playing with the imagery anymore. Music and art and literature is trying to get you to expand. And when you're using it, for racism, you're really kind of doing a disservice to your own imagination. Why don't you tell them about the news? As one offshoot of punk descended into darkness, another found itself shooting up the charts. Because of the perceived unmarketability of punk, the record industry created a more radio-friendly version and called it New Wave. When American radio stations said, punk rock, we won't play that, Seymour Stein had a, a little brainstorm, and he said, ah, I'll call it New Wave. This music wasn't as much punk as it was just a breath of fresh air. It worked very well, because suddenly, uh, just overnight, we went from being a punk band to being a New Wave band. And uh, we also got played on the radio after that. Bands like Talking Heads, Elvis Costello, Blondie, and the Go-Go's helped bring punk's edge to the mainstream by adopting a more commercial sound. But it came at a price. We were branded as selling out very early. I don't know, I think our aspirations started going beyond the L.A. punk scene. With Blondie, I really thought they were a great band. It wasn't until they did that disco stuff that they kind of broke, you know what I mean? cleaned up wholesome, you know, versions of the punk rock movement. Uh, so that just figures. I wouldn't have said I was making 100% punk rock music, but it was the punk rock attitude that was behind the f*** you of White Wedding. As New Wave gained commercial ground, punk was watered down, repackaged, and fed to the masses.